Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here virtually. My name is Giovanni Aloy. I'd like to thank Mateja and Erska to, for inviting me to this wonderful symposium. Unfortunately, my schedule prevents me to be there with you in person, but I hope that my presentation will bring up some interesting questions for us to consider in the conception of forests right now in contemporary culture. Uh, some of you might know I am the editor of Antenna, the Journal of Nature and Visual Culture, the editor of the uh, Art After Nature series of books published with Caroline Picard for University of Minnesota Press. And I have published many books on animals in art as well as plants in contemporary art. I uh, work in Chicago at the School of the Art Institute. And my specialization has really focused on the representation, objectification, and the role that realism plays in the context of representing the non-human. And my presentation today focuses very much on that subject, since forests have been, in the history of Western art, represented through sublime lenses. I ask, what do we do with the past that has in a way trapped into a specific kind of perception of the forest that it's beautiful and limiting at the same time. And I look at the work of contemporary artists that are trying to break that tradition and see how realism and perhaps even the sublime can help us if rewired in a certain way to understand forests in different and productive ways. So I'd like to begin from the concept of the straightforward path. A concept that I draw from Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, and more specifically from Hell, the moment in which Dante Alighieri enters the Selva Oscura in the Divine Comedy, which became the most influential cultural conception of the forest in the West. There, the lost poet encountered the three capital vices, envy, pride, and avarice, as incarnated in a leopard, a lion, and a she-wolf. And it's in the dark of the forest that Dante became physically, spiritually, psychologically, politically, and morally lost. At the beginning, Dante says, in the middle of the journey of our life, I found myself in a dark woods where the straight way had been lost side off. How hard is it to say what it was like in the thick of thickets, in a wood so dense and gnarled, the very thought of it renews my panic. It is bitter almost as death itself is bitter. But to rehearse the good, it also brought be. I will speak about the other things I saw there. How I got there I cannot clearly say, for I was moving like a sleepwalker the moment I stepped out of the right way. So interestingly, Dante qualifies the Selva Oscura as the scariest of places, bitter almost as death itself. And yet, he finds something good in it. And it's that good that I want to hold on to. Dante Alighieri's representation of the Selva Oscura, the dark forest in the Divine Comedy, Canto Primo, became the most influential cultural conception of the forest in the West. There, the lost poet encountered the three capital vices, envy, pride, and avarice, as incarnated in a leopard, a lion, and a she-wolf. In the dark forest, Dante became physically, spiritually, psychologically, politically, and morally lost. Symbolically, Dante's forest was a primordial maze. The entrance to the classical Hades of Virgil's Aeneid and a platonic image of chaotic matter in which the light of reason is obscured by the impenetrable deep of the vegetation. As a cultural space, the forest eluded the rationality of classical knowledge to such extent that it became the quintessential symbol of the unconsciousness. It was a space in which plants, humans, and animals engaged in a troubling fluidity. 
One enabled by the scarcity of light, the intricacy of tree growth, and the absence of human-made reference. It is in this context, too, that I'm interested in the conscience of sleepwalking that Dante Alighieri foregrounds in this passage. Is this sleepwalking the sleepwalk of reason? Or can we even understand the sleepwalk as the rise of humanism, our alienation from the rest of the non-human world, our loss, our feeling disconnected, our meaninglessness, the existentialist void that we filled only a hundred years later with humanism, the negativity, the sense of loss, the sense of corruption that is attached to the representation of the forest can be found in the wood of the suicides, which Dante encounters. Suicide was then considered an immoral act, and the souls of those who have died by suicide were transformed into trees as punishment. We have this recurring idea in Western art of the transformation of the human into a plant as a degrading transition, as something that takes away. It reduces the softness, the sentience of the flesh to the cold and hard, immutable substance of wood. This transformation, therefore, is always a reduction. And this general negative conception becomes evident during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance in Italy. I claim it's part of a worlding. And I use this term in reference to the very well-known text, The Rani of Sir Moore, an essay in Reading the Archives by Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak. In this essay, Spivak foregrounds the pervasive role that epistemic practices such as mapping and recording carried out by indigenous artists under the close guidance of colonialist officers played in worlding the new colonial Indian land. The forest in Western art is the result of a persistent worlding, I argue, operated by Christianity. Spivak, of course, it looks in her essay at the control exercised by the British Empire over Indian indigenous people. In Spivak's essay, through these Western coded practices of recording and rendering, the natives experience and cultural conception of their own land is re-encoded through the gaze of the settler. And over time, this practice gradually replaces the cultural sovereignty of indigenous populations with a colonial framework that denies their ability to culturally own their land, casting them as others. Spivak calls this process worlding, a concept originating from Heideggerian phenomenology, most precisely from being and time, that she adopts from his essay, The Origin of the Work of Art. To Heidegger, the world is not objective, but is the whole set of connections and meaningful relations that generate our experience as human beings or design. In this context, artworks intended as cultural artifacts of all kinds, produce a form of truth that is not primordial or given, but constructed by linguistic and discursive forces that sediment into realistic material entities such as maps or paintings and representations of the land, its fauna, flora, as well as the human cultures that inhabit it. So worlding produces meaningful worlds in which objects and beings are brought into relations by precise epistemic lenses and logics. Worlding emerges from a form of normative representation that at once envelops the living and non-living, embedding all its parts into a woven tapestry from which nothing 
can be disentangled without destroying weft and warp threads. In landscape painting, the depth of the perspective invites the viewer on a spiritual journey away from the dangers and the temptations of the forest. We see this repeatedly. The foreground of the paintings is dark. That's the beginning of the journey with the forest, from the forest, away from it, towards the horizon, towards hope, towards the light of God, where light often is the landscape that has more directly been shaped also by human activities and where we sometimes see a castle, a mansion, a town. The forest is so drenched in Christian references that even animals become actors on the stage of a morality play. The forest implicitly is depicted as a space in which man does not belong anymore. There is something uh, fascinating about the use of symbolism in these Sottobosco paintings by Otto Marseus von Schrieck. Uh, von Schrieck invented the genre of Sottobosco, which means undergrowth, in which plants, oftentimes different species of thistles, are used as symbols of Christ's passion, and animals symbolize either heavenly or evil presences. And of course, the evil presences are often impersonated by toads, lizards, and snakes, while butterflies symbolize the human soul. And during the Romantic period, of course, we encounter a further distancing of the human from the forest through the use of the sublime. The sublime casts the forest as an ancient site in which ultimately we are excluded from a relationship with the plants and the animals. We observe its greatness as an enigmatic presence to which we can no longer reconnect fully. Therefore, the forest has become representation, a representation walled by Christian ideas. And of course, other cultures provide different dimensions in which the forest can be conceived and in which interconnectedness becomes central. The Theravada Buddhism in Thailand is a great example in which monks renounce a life of excess and luxury in order to retreat in the forest to experience discipline, renunciation and meditation in order to fully realize the inner truth and peace taught by the Buddha. And living a life of austerity allows the forest monastics to simply refine their mind. And this refinement allows them to clearly and directly explore fundamental causes of suffering, as well as to turn inwardly to cultivate a path that leads towards freedom. So there is a different path we encounter in this conception of the forest that doesn't link darkness to light, but it's a path that is inward and a path that is personal and intimate. In the West, meanwhile, the forest retains, even through the work of the most groundbreaking and unconventional movements like surrealism, this Christian worlding, the coordinates of the forest as a place of the subconscious, the place of uncontrolled drives and desires is visible in Louis Bonuel and Salvador Dali's Un Chien Andalou, one of the most thought-provoking and revolutionary films in the history of surrealism. The forest still looks impenetrable, hostile and forbidden in the works of Max Ernst. But when we look at Frida Kahlo, a different reality begins to emerge. What we see here is the artist portraying herself as a deer, a wounded deer. As you can see in this forest, which is a forest of interconnectedness and empathy, everything is broken. 
The deer has been attacked by humans. The arrows clearly symbolize the intrusion of the human in a space of harmony. And a branch is broken. The vegetation, the analogy, the uh, empathy between animal and vegetal form. An empathy that we find again in the work of Wifredo Lam, The Jungle, in which human bodies and plants merge into the ritualistic, into a coming together that seems to express a fervent desire to live. And the question of representation has more recently led me to wonder what is the role the sublime can play in contemporary representations of the forest? What is the role that realism can play in representing the forest, given that even today when we think about forests, in the West, the worlding of Christianity is still governing our conception. So there are a few alternatives I've encountered that I find particularly interesting. Uh, Abel Rodriguez of the Nonuya people began to work as a local Amazonian guide for scientific expeditions during the 1980s. And by the 1990s, faced with loss and grief, as his community was displayed by political turmoil and environmental devastation, Rodriguez began to transfer his knowledge onto paper in the form of extremely detailed and dense drawings of trees in which every leaf and living being was of equal importance. And far from the objectifying aesthetics of Western botanical illustrations and painted entirely from memory, Rodriguez's plants evince the forest as one living organism in which everything is interconnected. And I think this notion, the interconnection and memory as well, how we can think about the forest as a thinking organism. I'm thinking, of course, of Eduardo Conn's How Forests Think as well. We find a conception that art can also articulate in productive ways, in ways that art can express without recurring necessarily to the tropes of a worlding that's dictated by Christianity. And it's in this context, therefore, that I think about these works as producing an unworlding of the forest, an unworlding that is not necessarily violent, but an unworlding that enables us to access new sets of code through which we can find our way back into the forest and a forest that no longer is, however, Dante's forest. Thinking about making our ways back into forests also led me to the work of Cecilia Vicuña, an indigenous Chilean artist who has more recently finally encountered the public acclaim that she has deserved for many decades. During the 1970s, Vicuña left Chile, especially because of the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, who came to power in 1973 through a military coup. Pinochet's regime was known for its authoritarian rule and human rights abuse, which created a hostile environment for artists and intellectuals. Vicuña, as a political engaged artist, felt the need to leave the country to escape censorship and persecution. The artist began to create in the early 1980s the sidewalk forests in New York. And as you can see, the attention she pays to these small vegetal realities that build at the edge of sidewalks that crack the pavement to burst into the fabric of the city, Vicuña finds a connective principle. She subverts the scale, the anthropocentric scale that has dictated for so many centuries our relationship to the forest and the woods in order to transform it into something more vulnerable, more fragile, something that requires our attention. And this connective tissue breeds life into the city itself. 
he breathed beneath the weight of the city and it reaches to the people that live in it above ground. Very meaningfully, contemporary artist Jonathan Keats said in a recent article that cities are rife with biodiversity. Urban biomes often host far more species than surrounding areas, including suburbs and agricultural lands. Layers of infrastructure amount to a kind of artificial geodiversity, and the sheer complexity of the built environment provides countless accidental habitats. Every sidewalk is a forest. So in Jonathan Keats' conception of Cecilia Vicuña's work, we find an invitation, a radical invitation to rethink from scratch what is a forest, where it begins and where it ends, and where this new conception, which have not been new to many indigenous and other cultures, can come to play a productive role in ecological dimensions as well, therefore impacting the ways we also engage with forests and preserve forests, or even contemplate the rights of forests to exist in the world. And again, I'd like to close with this recent work by Cecilia Vicuña, which made me think about a book by Ursula Le Guin, The Word of the World is Forest, in which the forest plays a central and multifaceted role in the overall narrative. It serves as a symbol of nature's power and resilience, representing a harmonious and interconnected ecosystem. The forest is depicted as a living entity with its own language and wisdom, which the indigenous Afshians, the native inhabitants of the planet, deeply understand and respect. And through their close relationship with the forest, the Atsheans embody a sustainable and balanced way of life in stark contrast to the destructive actions of the human colonizers. It is in this context that Cecilia Vicuña's Brain Forest Kipu that was exhibited at Tate Modern in London in 2022 captures this absolute paramount need to reconfigure, expand and take seriously our conception of forests. Brain Forest Kipo is a ghostly, sublime presence. So maybe there is still mileage in the sublime, in the way certain iterations of the sublime can engage us to think more carefully, more empathically about forests, about the devastation, but also about their importance because they are part of us and we are part of them. The kipu in indigenous Chilean culture is a communication system made of knots, made of fibers that come made together. Of- and it's in this unity, it is in this conception of continuity that we can finally and hopefully for good leave behind Dante Alighieri's Selva Oscura to find ourselves in a place where light is not divine, but it's the luminosity of interconnectedness, the luminosity of this shared world we all live in. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Giovanni, for this beautiful lecture. Um, And thank you for actually reminding us to shed light on uh, this deeply imprinted also tradition um, in Western culture um, regarding um, the relation of humans towards nature. Um, At the end of your lecture, you also um, shared with us different kind of examples. And I would like to start this conversation from the last um, artist that you mentioned, mentioned Cecilia Vicuña's work. Um, 
could you um, share with us more and explore maybe with us um, how do you see what forest stands for or represents in her artwork? I mean, um, the fact that she named this resilient, spontaneous vegetation in the cracks of the pavements in the city of New York uh, as forest. Um, how do you see um, or how do you read this connection um, in her artwork between forest as a very complex ecosystem and this, let's say, feral um, urban vegetation? Yes, uh, that's a very important question in the context of new conceptions of forests, because I feel that in the humanities and in the arts, we are reconfiguring the conception of forests in ways that become metaphorical. So there is an interesting alignment and perhaps misalignment between the metaphorical and the ecological. The two are connected. I think the more we reframe the metaphorical dimension of what a forest is in our minds, the more we might be able to engage with forests on an ecological level in ways that are more productive, more respectful, more considerate of the rights of forests. What rights have forests to exist and not to be disturbed by us, for instance. Uh, one of the aspects I find very important in Cecilia Vicuña's work is this very personal, very intimate desire to expand the conception of forest in the urban context so that we can reconnect. A lot of my work recently, since I began to work on my Lucian Freud book that came out in 2019, Lucian Freud Herbarium, revolves around this connection. The domestic and what is near, what is mundane, what is close to us, and the sublime, what is more distant, what is more uh, remote. Because I'm very aware, and perhaps perhaps painfully so, that a lot of the theory that is produced in the field of animal studies, as well as critical plant studies, eco-criticism, is produced in cities. It is produced in around universities, situated in urban settings, where the very idea of nature exists as an abstract term because of the situatedness of the minds that are conceiving nature as something far away, as something over there. And that is, we have to live with that. I don't think, you know, just to quote Donna Haraway, I think it's one of the facets of, of staying with the trouble. You know, we can't necessarily solve that. Those of us who have predominantly lived in cities all our lives can pretend that they have an understanding of trees and the ecologies that trees establish away from cities that is the same as somebody who's lived up in the mountains for the entirety of their lives. But at the same time, I think both parties have, some, have something to bring to the table. And when I was talking to Cecilia Vicuña a few weeks ago for an interview, we found this communal point where she talked to me about the forests, the sidewalk forests and what they meant to her. It was about uprooting. It was about losing that connection with the natural world that she was close to in Chile. And I said to her, well, those, those forests speak to me a lot, those, those urban forests, because when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in Milan, but my parents were from the south of Italy. So we would spend the summer in the south and then travel back for school the rest of the year. And to me, being away from the nature of the South was really traumatic. And it was repeating itself every year. I just felt disconnected. I felt like what I cared about was not the urban reality and what the city has to offer, but the beauty of that natural environment. And I began to look for it everywhere I could in the most, you know, places where people would say, oh, but there's nothing in that river. There's no, it's all dead in that canal. If you look carefully, you'd actually see that there was life and there was plenty of it. But we had all been educated not to see. We had become nature blind to the point that nobody was even looking in the canal. And then I looked and I said, like, well, look, there's newts, there's frogs, there's little fish. 
And it's a micro ecosystem that's really valuable and precious. So I believe that that kind of empathy that we can build in the mundane, in what is out there on our doorsteps in cities, is just as important as the forest out there. And I think that if we nurture that ability to see everywhere around us, then we will understand better why forests matter as environments, as ecosystems that are valuable and that we can also feel part of because we've, all, we've kind of practiced on the small scale of the urban forest environment, how to be part of it, how to look, how to see, how to engage. So it might seem like Cecilia Vicuña's um, sidewalk forests are not real forests in the classical sense of definition that may apply to science or botany, but they are forests in the context of connectivity. They are microecological systems that burst through and sustain urban microecologies of which we are part. So the invitation, I guess, is to try and reconfigure the idea of the forest, not to detract from the beauty or the ecological importance of places that must be safeguarded, but to find a way to connect with them and be part of the forest in original ways. And I think there is a lot of work to be done in that sense, because we tend to return to the forest as tourists most of the time. I, When I teach a class at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago called Pulse Nature, where we engage with this task of, through, of course, a number of artists and scholars, this task of reconstructing new ideas of nature from what we inherited from the past and to see how we can make that concept that is obsolete useful. And what troubles my student is the realization that our forests are no longer untouched, that they're no longer places of what we might consider true nature we know that that term is obsolete. It doesn't mean anything anymore. We know that it's it's dangerous. But the idea that all the forests, the vast majority of the forests in the world have been manipulated. They have been turned into farmland, especially in the United States. And now they are being returned to the state of forest. And since the concept of nature is obsolete and it no longer applies to many areas, many forests, because they have been manipulated over time, uh, it is really essential that, that we abandon that romantic idea and, and think, what can we do with this concept? What can we do with this idea in, in the context of the climate emergency, in the context of the importance that these places also play in our thinking. Okay, uh, thank you. I have another question, maybe a short one, um, sure. which comes back actually to your, actually to the abstract of your talk. Um, and I was wondering, uh, do you think that in um, contemporary art, forest is still perceived, as you mentioned in your abstract, as a place of loss, of loss of faith, loss of life, loss of sanity in the majority of the artworks, or uh, is this current already shifting? I think um, the, the, the title of the talk is pointing to the idea that the shift is from loss to recovery, because I think that that's really the, the crucial demise of the anthropocentric ideas that made us feel that positioned us in an antagonistic relationship with the forest, the idea of the unconscious, the idea of letting go of rationality is exactly what we need now to recover a much more in tuned and attuned way of being with the forest that we, I like to think, and when I say we, I know the we's, are, we's of the world are problematic nowadays, but I think about humanity in its different geographical situations, some cultures have retained that being more attuned and more embedded in the forest as a place of care, as a place of shelter, as a place of intimacy. And I like to think that European 
uh, cultures had that too at some point before deforestation became um, part of a common practice of expansion. You know, I'm thinking about the Roman Empire, of course, based on my heritage and how deforestation played such an important role in, in maintaining the empire. I find that in the United States, ideas of colonialism seem to begin with 1492 in people's minds, and the Roman Empire never gets brought up as a precedent of <laughs> colossal uh, importance in that those very processes and ideas that are associated with the colonialism of the United States, of Americas. And um, I think the recovery is the, the difficult part. The recovery is where we need art to help us think new models. Because the recovery of ecology, the recovery of science, is a recovery that can only imagine a certain direction. And the recovery of art can imagine a different direction that oftentimes tends to be more multidisciplinary and more holistic. As you know, one of the big strengths of this non-human turn over the past 30, let's even stretch it to say 40 years, I feel optimistic and generous today, um, is the idea that the artist is reconfiguring, are reconfiguring themselves as agents. And, and they think about themselves as connectors between disciplines. They're, they're truly multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. And I love the fact that we have a range of artists today, many of which I've published in Antenna as well, who are not afraid and are very, very brave when it comes to engaging with science or with fields in which they are no authority and they acknowledge that they are no authority and that they're engaging with this field as an outsider because outsiders can help those inside find blind spots or find new directions. And I believe, I know how hard it is. I have been collaborating in art and science projects for many years. It's extremely hard to find the, the shared jargon, the communal framework of references to put trust into what we do and what we say reciprocally, you know, it's, it's, it's really a challenge, but some artists do it really well. And to me, that is part of the recovery. We have to recover our humanity, our empathy from humanism. Humanism made us the opposite of humans. That's the paradox, right? Of humanism as a philosophy. And we need to recover ourselves. So artists like, Abel Rodriguez using memory to represent the forest that has been destroyed and representing it for others to keep the stories alive is tragic, but it's part of a recovery process that foregrounds memory as something that the forest has. I'm thinking about, again, Eduardo Kahn. You know, those ideas are all interconnected in this ecological form of thinking that also, of course, Timothy Morton has done great work in, in mapping. And... Um, Cecilia Vicuña, to me, does the same. It's a process of recovery. They both come from places of loss, different kind of loss. And I think we have to acknowledge that. Those representations that I show in the first part of the uh, present, my, my talk are representations of loss. They're beautiful because we have been trained over time to think of the forest as this beautiful, sublime place. But it, they, they're just places of loss. And we, we need to move on through a recovery that entails other perspectives, because clearly the Western perspective has ended up into ecological crisis, into um, a disaster in so many ways that we need to undo. So that, that's the recovery part.